We need a chat box. Okay, so let's start with questions. Does anybody have a question? No question. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I think what I'm going to do is um, give you the, we were talking about um, the Monte Carlo method and um, I think before continuing with the Monte Carlo method, I will give you, uh, okay, uh, there was a chat question here. Um, in, in problem 914, it's a ring. Uh, if, it were a, if it were a disc, I would have said disc. Instead, I said ring or circle. Um, a circle looks like this, a disc is something like that. Um, and um, I don't know about a hint. Um, I think I'm gonna let you guys work on it. After all, the next homework assignment has been already reduced to three problems. Um, and uh, what you should do is, um, apply what you've learned about um, Legendre polynomials and spherical harmonics to this problem. And so, um, all right, sort of a hint. Um, if it's a ring, you should be able to compute the potential on the z-axis. Then you express the potential at arbitrary angles, theta and phi from the z-axis uh, in terms of spherical harmonics. And you require agreement on the z-axis. And so that gives you the answer. All right, I've, that, that I think was too explicit. So let me um, just give you a lightning review of the bare bones of um, uh, probabilities. These things are things that um, statisticians call PDFs. And I guess what they mean by PDF is probability distribution function or probability density function. I don't know. They almost never say what they mean by PDF. But anyway, the, the principal distribution so, uh, is the binomial distribution. And um, let's see, everybody can see the screen. There's no problem seeing the screen. I hope, let me just, all right. I think everybody can see the screen. Um, if the probability of success is P on each try, and you, thank you, Lambda, and uh, we, we make N trials, capital N trials, then the mean number of successes um, or the average number of successes will be the number of trials times the probability of each trial and that's N inside brackets. And um, I apologize for using the letter N to stand for three different things in this problem. Um, uh, Probability of failure on a given trial, trial is, um, or a try is uh, one minus the probability of success. And so the probability of a particular sequence of successes and failures, such as N successes followed by capital N minus little n failures is this. And um, now how many different sequences are there all with this same probability 
because clearly the order doesn't matter. Um, well, there are n factorial possible sequences, but we don't distinguish ones where we just shuffle the, the successes and the failures amongst themselves. And so we take this ratio here. And this then is the binomial probability distribution, namely the binomial probability of having n successes in capital N trials if p is the probability of success on each trial is given by this expression. And that's the binomial coefficient. It, uh, I guess it was Bernoulli who worked this out first. Now you see we've derived this distribution um, from, uh, this by the way is in the, I, I added these to the example section. I can uh, give you a bit of a graph of this if we go here to um, the binomial distribution. This is the full text, I'm not gonna go through that. Here's the binomial probability distribution um, for P equal to 20%. 125, uh, capital N, how many trials? Well, 125, 250, 500, 1,000. And um, this is the, the distribution um, that you'd get. Um, of course, it's not really continuous. It's actually defined for each little n. But as we're going um, as capital N, even in this case is 125, you divide this distance here, actually it goes all the way up to here, 125. Um, you take a point for each of those and draw a curve through it, it, it starts to look like a continuous curve. And then when you are dealing with a thousand curves, it's absolutely continuous. What you can see here is that this should look a little bit like a Gaussian distribution. And we'll understand that in a minute. Um, so uh, Poisson then um, approximated this formula. Notice that this formula is great. It's, 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 it, we, we derived this from pure thought and mathematics. So this is rigorously true, but it has certain disadvantages, namely that these, if N is a thousand and little N is say 250, we're dealing with factorials that not even a computer can um, give you uh, exact numbers on. I mean, they, because they're just the, the size of those integers is just fantastic. And so what, what um, Poisson did was he took the limit n going to infinity with the probability of success, in other words, an infinite number of, uh, almost an inf a very large number of trials, a very small probability on each of success on each one, but he kept the, the average number of successes constant. And then using Sterling's formula, which we derived in, I must fix these question marks. Um, uh, um, using Sterling's formula for the two large factorials, what we find, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. You can look at this online or download the PDF. Uh, what Poisson did was he um, found that in that limit, this thing, which is very complicated, uh, well, very hard to deal with because of the huge factorials, turns out you just have one factorial and that factorial is, um, uh, well, it's a little n factorial, the number of successes. And, um, and uh, it turns out that it's then uh, the, the average number of successes raised to the nth power divided by n factorial times e to the minus the average number of successes. And um, so that's uh, Poisson's estimate. And um, I may have a graph of that here. I, uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, I did not graph it. That's too bad. Uh, maybe I should graph it. Anyway, Gauss considered a different limit. 
he took little n and big N to go to infinity and kept the probability fixed. Um, so remember what Poisson did. Let's see what Poisson did. What Poisson did was take the number of tri tries going to infinity, the probability going to zero, and the average number of successes constant. What Gauss did instead was he also let the number of, um, sorry, you must be going crazy as I move this the page around. What he kept, what he did was he kept the probability fixed, probability of success on each trial fixed, but let the number of successes and the number of tries go to infinity. And then taking the limit, uh, what he found was this approximation. So this is Gauss's approximation to the binomial distribution. Q is always one minus P, capital N is the average number of trials. And what people, uh, this thing is normalized. And um, what people often, people often do is extend the integer N to a continuous variable X. So then that becomes X. And then uh, the average number of successes, which is uh, P capital N, um, this is written as mu. And uh, so then what we have here is the, well, what we always have is the um, number of successes minus the average number of successes. And that squared is called sigma squared. Oh gosh, sorry about that. I don't know what it is about the mouse that is so touchy. Anyway, so this is called then sigma squared. And when you do that, we get what's called the standard form of Gauss's notation, which is one over square root of two pi sigma and e to the minus x minus the average value of x squared divided by two sigma squared. And uh, sigma is called um, the, uh, the standard deviation. Um, so I should have named uh, sigma. I, I have um, tended to, um, uh, I don't pay that much attention to names and so I forget to name things and forget what things are called. And I'm sorry about that, but I think I'll insert something uh, to that effect here. Okay, so, um, but we can see what it is. Sigma is the square root of the average value of the square of the, of the, difference between X and the average value of X. So it's the variance basically. So the, the word here that I'm looking for was variance. Okay, so now that we've um, had a lightning review of um, probability of the main distributions in uh, probability, um, theory, we can go back to this uh, case here. And what do we have? We have pr um, primary com com uh, cosmic rays. The number capital N is huge, but the number P is incredibly tiny. And uh, so we'll see that that corresponds to Poisson's distribution. What Poisson did, he let the number of trials, as in this case, the number of cosmic rays goes to infinity, but the probability of anything happening of interest going to zero. And that's what we have here, the probability that a cosmic ray hits a nitrogen nucleus, shatters it, produces uh, a shower of pions or pi mesons, um, which in turn uh, decay into muons uh, and um, neutrinos and um, 
then the muons further decay into two neutrinos plus an electron, an electron. And uh, by the way, the when I say muon, it could be an anti-muon electron, it could be a positron, and neutrino could be an anti-neutrino of either the electron type or the mu type. And then these things come shooting down and the probability that any one of them, the probability little p, that any one of them actually hits um, an underground detector and produces a muon is very, 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 very small. And um, in the experiment in question, um, although the number n of cosmic rays was huge, the number of muons was basically one every 10 days. And um, uh, so then we, we are in the, the the, uh, we take the binomial distribution and uh, take Poisson's limit, and then we have a Poisson distribution. And so little uh, n inside of brackets is the average number of muons per day, that was one tenth. And um, so this is the formula that we would use. So um, I wrote a Fortran program and my, one of my sons who's a computer scientist wrote a C program. And these are available in, GitHub, you go to that place. Um, and uh, this is what we found, um, namely that um, in a hundred days, uh, we could have so many histories. Th these are a million histories each of a hundred days. Um, and uh, so what we found was, this is the curve for the number of, uh, number of histories of 100 days in which a maximum of n muons is detected in a single day. These are these boxes and in 100 days. And um, so the, the, the code um, is not particularly hard to write. And the great advantage of uh, the code is that then if you decide to change what uh, the number of the expected number of or the average number of muons per day is um, it uh, you just change one line of code whereas if you had actually done this by hand or with a calculator you'd um, have to repeat the whole damn thing and it'd be just awful um, one of the really important um, applications of um, the Monte Carlo is something that um, Roy Glauber told me was actually invented by Fermi, but that um, Fermi um, was so busy doing both nu nuclear physics and theoretical physics and helping the uh, Manhattan Project that um, he didn't bother to publish it. He just explained it to people at Los Alamos and they eventually published it. Um, and it became known as the Metropolis algorithm. Um, and the, the idea, what Fermi realized was that if you, if you, um, uh, used this uh, metropolis algorithm, you could generate a sequence of states of a system that in, in such that the system was distributed according to any probability distribution that you wanted. And uh, so let us as an example, suppose we're talking about trying to predict the shape of a protein. This is a uh, very difficult problem. And um, the reason it's difficult is that we don't have good formulas for what the um, uh, electrostatic potential is between one molecule and another molecule or between one uh, uh, assortment of atoms and another assortment of atoms. And notice these are not atoms in empty space. These are atoms in a, uh, an aqueous or there's a water environment in which there are dissolved salts and various macromolecules. So it's, it's um, simply a nightmare, um, but um, one can approximate these potentials. 
Um, so let's suppose we have a protein of 200 amino acids. That would mean we'd have about 4,000 atoms. Each atom we would say would uh, have three coordinates for its location. So that's a 12,000 components. So we've got a vector with 12,000 components. That vector is called X. And we're trying to compute, we, we imagine we have some sort of a formula for the energy of that uh, configuration of 4,000 atoms. Um, that's um, uh, pretty hard to do. In fact, the real progress in this problem was made by a physicist at the university, at Washington University in, I guess it's Seattle. Um, and what he did was he took advantage of the uh, large number of protein uh, shapes that have been determined by X-ray crystallography and are in something called the protein data bank. Used to be at Brookhaven and I think it's been moved to Rutgers. Okay, anyway, we start with some random artificial initial configuration X zero and we make random changes in successive configurations. And um, one way to do this is to make a tr small random change in coordinate XI. Remember there are 12,000 coordinates in this example. So we change the, one of the coordinates, the ith coordinate, and then we test whether to accept the change or not by comparing the energies of the two configurations. And um, the, uh, the way we do that, well, first is that we, we need to not build in any asymmetry into the problem. And so if we change a particular coordinate, for example, the Y coordinate of the 396th atom, um, we would change it by uh, having a step size delta X, um, which we would keep constant independent of I. And uh, we generate a random number between zero and subtract a half. So the probability of going uh, far, of pushing it, that coordinate up, uh, let's see, out in the Y direction, um, or backwards in the negative y direction, those are uh, equal. And uh, sorry about that. I mean, just the slightest change in the mouse. Anyway, and these the sequence of configurations should be ergodic. That is to say, you sh from any configure x, you should be able to get any other configuration x prime by a sequence of changes. And um, I, I, it's pretty clear that this this proposition here would uh, would do that. Um, so then the, the big question is how to decide whether to accept or reject this change. And that was uh, Fermi's insight and it was the, it's called the metropolis step. Um, what we do is um, if the energy of the new configuration is less, we always accept it. But sometimes the energy of the, or often, half the time, in fact, the energy of the new configuration will be higher. Well, we don't reject it completely. What we do is we, re we accept it with a conditional probability. And uh, that conditional probability is e to the minus the difference in energy, that's a positive difference, divided by kT. That's the energy um, of a degree of freedom or twice the energy of a degree of freedom um, at uh, temperature T. Now, of course, what's the temperature? The temperature is whatever the temperature we're talking about. And if we're talking about proteins, we'd be talking about uh, the temperature of the animal in which uh, this protein is, uh, um, is uh, functional. Uh, or we would, um, if we're we have an industrial application, then it would be the temperature of the industrial application. Um, so what we do is we generate a random number between zero and one. And once again, uh, 
one ought to generate a quasi-random number. That would be the best way to do that. And um, we accept the new configuration if the random number is less than this uh, exponential. Now notice, if the new configuration has a huge energy, then this is going to be e to the minus huge divided by kt. This is going to be zero. The chance of accepting it's going to be Zippo. On the other hand, if e prime minus e is a very tiny change, then this is going to be almost one. And the chance of accepting it will be almost one. And um, so we can see that that's a reasonable way of doing things. In Fortran 90, the metropolis step looks like this. If the new energy is less than the old energy, of course, you have to define what new e and old e are. Um, those are e prime and e. Uh, we set the new coordinate to the old coordinate plus delta x, delta x being this thing. Well, no, not that. If this thing, that thing being this thing. Um, Otherwise, we generate a random number. And if the random number is less than this, which is this expression here, then we accept it. And that's how it is. And we don't bother to consider the other case because the other case would be rejection. And then we just leave Xi the way it was. And that's what happens with this, with this loop. You can see from this that Fortran is a very easy uh, language to learn and to use. Uh, the exclamation point is just uh, these are comments, and so the program doesn't program ignores anything over the after the exclamation point. So the next point is to vary the next coordinate, and uh, after you go through all twelve thousand coordinates, you finish a sweep. After thousands or millions of sweeps, you say that the thing is thermalized. Once it's thermalized, you start measuring the properties. You know, the shape or something else. And um, you compute, you use the shape of the protein to compute a physical quantity every hundred or every thousand sweeps. And then you take an average of these measurements. And that's an estimate of the mean value of that physical quantity at temperature T. Um, now, why does this work? Well, if you have two configurations that have two different energies. All right, hold on, we've got a question here. Um, what we're trying to do here uh, in this particular case is just uh, to produce a distribution uh, of this form, which is what we expect as a thermal distribution. That is to say, what we want eventually is to have a, is to have a distribution of states or vectors of 12,000 components that are distributed according to this probability distribution. This is a normalization factor called the partition function, and they are distributed this way. So this is what you expect for a thermal distribution of molecules. Now, if you're talking about something else like uh, photons in a black body of a certain um, uh, size or fermions in a particular configuration, then you be, might be talking about a different um, probability distribution. This um, Monte Carlo method works, as, you'll, as I'll show you in a moment, for a whole um, class of, uh, but basically for any probability distribution. But we have to change it a little bit. We, in other words, th this was the key step here. This was the key step right here. And um, if we have a different probability distribution, then we use a different thing over here. All right, now why does this work? Let's stay with the simple exponential. Um, consider two configurations and um, that at some moment they're occupied by probabilities. In other words, we've gone through T steps in this distribution. I don't know why I called it T. I was thinking of time in some sense. Uh, and, oh, thermalized, that's what T means. And um, 
X prime. So two different probability distributions. We imagine they have energy E and E prime. Suppose E is greater than E prime. So then the rate of going from X to X prime is the probability of getting to X prime first and then um, the rate of choosing X prime, I'm sorry, the rate of choosing X, uh, the rate of choosing X, X when one is at X prime. And that is, you see a symmetrical thing because this is the random number on zero to one minus a half. So you can go equally, you're equally likely to go right or left. And then the probability of being an X prime, uh, a probability of being at X prime. So it's just, it's just, so the probability of going from X to X prime is the probability of getting to X and then the probability of choosing to go to X prime. And um, since the energy of X prime is lower, you don't have any conditionality here. On the other hand, the reverse rate of going from X prime to X is the probability of getting to X prime, the probability of choosing X when you're at X prime, and then this, this factor that is the difference in the energies divided by KT exponentiated. And so the next rate, net, net rate of going from X to X prime is the difference of the two. And you see V factors out. And what we have is the, the probability of being at X prime at, at position T in the thermalization minus the probability of being at X prime at position T times the exponential. That's a net flow of um, probability um, from actually, I think I, I may have this backwards here because I would, I think this is the probability. Yeah, right. I think this is the net probability of going from X to X prime. So it's X to X prime is what I should have here. Um, it's anyway, it's positive only if this thing is positive. And so it, it's positive when this ratio is greater than that exponential. And so the thing slows down and um, the net flow stops and we get to equilibrium when this thing is equality rather than one greater than the other. And um, that then gives you this equality here. Notice then that the probability at equilibrium, as we approach equilibrium, probably being at X at time T in the thermalization is this thing here. This times the E prime part of the, of the exponential is independent of X. And so we get to a, uh, so PT of X approaches this distribution, some constant times E to the minus E over KT. And that's of course what we want. And then we just find C by normalization, summing over X. And um, we then uh, get this expressed. So then we get uh, Boltzmann's distribution, E to the minus energy over KT divided by the uh, partition function. In a real life simulation, what you do is you just measure the physical quantity you want every, hundred or thousand sweeps after thermalization and average them. And when you average them, you don't even need to compute the partition function. Here's an example um, of um, what's called a lattice gauge theory, the very simplest one in four dimensions, Z2. Z2 is the simple group consisting of the number one and minus one. You see it's closed under multiplication, one times minus one is minus one minus one times minus one is one, one times one is one. So there it is. Um, what you do is you put a group element on each uh, link of the lattice. So here, maybe I should show you what's going on here. Um, so what we've got here is 
if we're in two dimensions, of course, we're really in four dimensions, but we're in a lattice. And so we put um, a group element on each link. In fact, let me um, maybe undo that and switch to maybe blue. So we've got a group element. Dr. Cahill, your notebook is hidden. Right, thank you. So we've got a group element, a different group element, of course, U, U prime, U double prime, U triple prime on each link. And then we assign an action to that um, square. That little square is called a plaquette, um, French word for little square. Um, and uh, the action then is said to be one minus the product of the um, group elements along the uh, links of the lattice. Um, uh, it would be u, u prime, but here you take the inverse of u double prime and the inverse of u triple prime because you're, you're going against the grain in these two cases. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the action of each plaquette. And um, in, the exp in the program, you replace E of X over KT with beta S where beta S, where S is the sum of all the plaquettes. Now, of course, you don't need to sum all the plaquettes. If you're varying this guy here, then what you have to do is you have to compute the energy of this plaquette and the energy of this plaquette if you're in two dimensions. If you're in three dimensions, you also have to, have to do the plaquette that goes, goes up like that. So let me just point that out. In other words, you'd have a plaquette that would look like this, and then another one that would go down like that. And uh, so then you'd have four plaquettes to evaluate. And in four dimensions, you'd have yet uh, yet more. So that's that's how that goes in SU3 lattice gauge theory. You do the same thing, but you put, um, uh, this is in Wilson. What Wilson did was he replaced continuum gauge theory with his lattice gauge theory in which the actual gauge fields were replaced by group elements. And um, in my opinion, that's um, almost um, taking the, I mean, it's, a, it's legitimate as long as the gauge fields are very, very small, but um, not if they're not small. Anyhow, so I, I think it's better to actually keep the gauge fields, but um, I was not able to convince the community of that. Anyway, um, so it, suppose you have a more general um, uh, probability distribution that just P of X. So this is not Boltzmann, this is whatever you want. And um, so then what you do is um, if you're at, uh, so let's see, if you're at X, and P of X prime is greater than P of X, then you always accept the new configuration X prime. If on the other hand, X prime has a smaller probability, then you take the ratio of the small probability to the probability of being where you are and you use that ratio and you accept, you generate a random number and if the random number is less than this, you accept, otherwise not. And once again, the rate going from X to X prime, if X prime has a larger probability, it's just the rate of um, basically doing this uh, uh, choice times the probability of being at X and the rate for going the opposite way is the same thing with X prime, but then uh, with this ratio instead of unity. And so you get once again, um, a uh, probability distribution then that is, uh, well, let me say, you get a probability distribution eventually that's the same thing as P of X 
where uh, divided by the partition function, where the partition function is the integral of the sum of p of x. Uh, so um, it turns out that this um, has another application that's um, purely numerical, namely that you can approximate um, highly multiple integrations. And by highly multiple, of course, what we're talking about here, remember, um, whoops, um, uh, if you have, um, if you have, uh, let us say you're in four dimensions. So if uh, D is equal to four, and you put 10 points on each direction, then you have 10 to the point, uh, 10 to the fourth lattice points in four dimensions. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do better, well, you put 100 points in each direction, and then that's 10, that's 100 to the fourth lattice points, or um, 10 to the eighth lattice points. And um, anyway, you might, you t I think in simulations that are done even with supercomputers taking a long time, one is somewhere between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the eighth in the number of points. Um, so, um, so what you're doing here is a multiple integral and what you're really doing is you're saying that the average value of some observable A, this is what you're really trying to do, e to the minus the Euclidean action um, of all the fields or the plaquettes or whatever the variables are, you're then integrating over all those fields times the A of those fields and you're normalizing it with this uh, integral. So these things are path integrals. So, um, so thought of as path integrals, they're infinite dimensional integrals. Thought of as lattice gauge theory integrals, they're integrals over um, 10,000 or 100 million points. And so that's what I mean by highly multiple integration. And uh, you can use the um, metropolis method to approximate integrals that are integrals of um, uh, that very high dimension in this way, using this trick. And um, it turns out that um, nature, uh, by chance, uh, discovered this procedure. And um, uh, and uh, it's the Darwinian uh, step rather than the metropolis step. And uh, what happens is that one, um, there are random changes of DNA uh, and um, these random changes lead to individuals of different, um, with different characteristics and they uh, do better or worse than their peers and the ones who do better tend to have more children and uh, that's um, what's happened over the last uh, 4 billion years on this planet. Okay, I think that's um, basically that um, uh, for uh, Monte Carlo methods. As I said, you can, in the exercises and in the text, I say that you can go to this latticeguy.net slash lattice and get various codes of um, Kreutz's codes. He writes in C and um, you can compile and run them and uh, do games like this. Um, uh, or you can write your own code or you can you know, apply it to something other than lattice gauge theory. Um, you could, I'm, I'm not sure what, but um, if any of you uh, individually or as a group want to do a project, uh, you could do something in lattice gauge theory. Um, 
also um, MATLAB has built-in routines for doing Monte Carlo simulations. I've never used them. I've always written in my own, written my own codes, but um, uh, uh, it would be worth uh, playing with them. And of course, the the problem with MATLAB is that although it's free at UNM, it's expensive in the uh, real world of uh, industry, and um, it tends to be free in the academic world, but um, expensive in the uh, industrial world. And I think every license is $10,000 per year. And so even the Air Force Research Lab um, tends to choke uh, at um, this expense. A um, million dollars for a toilet seat is one thing, but uh, $10,000 for a MATLAB license, well, that's too much. Uh, so the other thing is you can learn Python, and that's a very useful uh, um, uh, set of programs that is freely available. Okay, let me, um, I'm going to skip, uh, I think, to um, do some special relativity. I could skip directly to general, but somehow it seems as though I ought to go through special relativity first. Um, because it's it's used in all your courses or many of your courses, and so it's really uh, important. So an inertial reference frame is a system of coordinates in which free particles move in straight lines at constant speeds. And um, so, for example, if you're uh, in a tall skyscraper in an elevator, you get on the elevator and the damn cord breaks and you're going down, then for a while you're in an inertial reference frame. Um, uh, our space-time, of course, has one time dimension, and we write that uh, in SI units, CT, X with an upper zero is a CT, and the space dimensions are three vector X, X, Y, Z, or X1, X2, X3. The quadratic separation between two infinitesimally separated points is called ds squared, and um, that's minus c squared dt squared plus the physical distance, the ordinary distance squared. And in the absence of gravity, ds squared is the physical quadratic separation. And um, in, in the case of um, gravity, this thing is changed somewhat so that um, here, let me switch maybe to blue. Um, you then have ds squared is equal to um, gik dxi dxk. And in reality, um, gik is approximately equal to um, what we call eta ik which is um, minus one, 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 with zeros everywhere else. Um, this is this matrix here. And um, Einstein in, introduced a summation convention in which if, in which if you had um, A, I, L, B, L, J, this, means a sum L equals zero to three of uh, A, I, L, B, L, J. So one, one um, lower index, one upper index, same upper, same lower index means a sum. And that meant that you can dispense with this symbol, which is takes time to write. And in, in um, Einstein's day, uh, it was probably a uh, nightmare of type typesetting to, uh, to produce this, at least um, in an ordinary uh, physics department. Um, Lorentz transformations turn coordinate differences. Oh, let me, I skipped something. Uh, so in the absence of gravity, this is this thing ds squared is physical. 
and well, even in the even with gravity, it's physical. But then uh, the gravitational field, which distorts spacetime, uh, gives you changes eta to uh, g i k, and it is physics. So d s squared is physical, and so it must be independent of one's changes of coordinates. And the changes of coordinates that leave d s squared invariant are called Lorentz transformations. In general relativity, um, the uh, changes of coordinates that are allowed are any changes of coordinates that leave ds squared written this way invariant, and you can have any change of coordinates you want, and, um, you, and these are called general coordinate transformations, and then um, uh, ds squared remains invariant, and so that was Einstein, one of Einstein's many insights was to go from, uh, well, to invent Lorentz transformations and then go to general coordinate transformations. Um, so it, it turns out that a Lorentz transformation will uh, preserve ds squared if uh, basically in matrix notation, uh, what have I done here? If in matrix note, so let me go to maybe black. Um, in matrix notation, that's uh, L A to L is equal to uh, A to M. And um, what you can see is that A to squared is just the four by four identity matrix. And uh, so L inverse turns out to be this. And another way of writing it is that. Um, a Lorentz transformation in the x1 direction looks like this. Um, and now, there, as you know, I think points that are in which ds squared is mainly spatial are called space-like. Um, uh, and what's remarkable is that space, if you have two space-like events or uh, two events whose separation is space-like, then there are Lorentz frames in which they occur at the same, in which the events occur at the same time. On the other hand, time-like events are ones in which ds squared is negative because the time difference dominates. And then um, there are, if you have two events whose separation is time-like, they occur in the same place in some Lorentz frames. And light-like ones are ones that are connected by a light ray and they have uh, ds squared equal to zero. Um, now, the, these coordinates here transform under Lorentz transformations this way. And um, in particular, since the Lorentz transformations don't depend upon, uh, at least in special relativity, don't depend upon position, then what we have is that uh, dx prime k will be uh, L k L dx L. And uh, uh, anyway, vectors that transform this way so that a prime k is L k L a L. These are things that are trans that are said to be uh, to transform contravariantly. On the other hand, derivatives are said to transform uh, covariantly, and um, uh, so and the way derivatives transform are uh, the derivative with respect to x j prime by a chain rule is given by this. In other words, partial partial x prime j is partial xl, partial x prime j, partial partial uh, xl. And um, this partial xl, partial x prime j, well, you see, you use the fact that xl is l inverse lj x prime j. And so you can write it in this way. Um, so, uh, 
some of the concepts of special relativity are proper time. The proper time is uh, minus ds squared over c squared. And so if you have a, ma of a massive particle moving with speed v, that um, the thing would go uh, v dt uh, in time dt. And so ds squared would be this structure here. And d tor squared then is minus ds squared over c squared. So it's this expression here. And um, the time uh, delta tor is called the proper time. And um, the actual time that we uh, would see dt is the proper time then divided by this quantity here. So in other words, if you're sitting in a laboratory and you have something moving past you at really fast speed, the clock, the moving clock goes tick, 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 and your clock goes tick, 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 tick. And uh, an example is muons that uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere, um, or rather, you have a cosmic ray hitting, say, nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere, producing ions, which decay into muons. A muon at rest has a mean life of about two microseconds. But these um, uh, muons produced at 10 kilometers um, uh, take three uh, times 10 to the minus five seconds to hit the ground. And since the lifetime is two, 10 to the minus six, you'd have very few of them hitting the ground. Um, in fact, it would be two parts in 10 million, or three parts in 10 million. On the other hand, if the muon has this energy, which is a plausible energy for a cosmic ray muon, a, a muon produced by a cosmic ray, then um, this time dilation factor is uh, one minus, 0.99 squared, and that means that the the uh, Earth clock would um, uh, would uh, would have um, been uh, would go 1.6 10 to the minus five seconds, whereas the um, uh, the, in other words, in the time that a muon would take, mean decay time, the lifetime of the muon gets stretched by a factor of almost 10. And that means that the probability of survival goes up to 0.12. And that's why uh, it's a, a time dilation here is a factor of 460,000. Um, I'm Right, and because that's comparing this to the uh, to this, that's what we're talking about. Um, more special relativity. The the if we divide dxi by i here goes from zero to three. I'm trying to avoid a lot of Greek letters, and because I think that they confuse people who weren't raised in Greece. Um, so dxi d tor is uh, dxi dt times dt d tor. And so that's CV over this uh, square root. And uh, u0 then is that, and u is this. OK. The product, what's, what this is called the um, proper velocity, I think. Anyway, you multiply it by the mass of the particle, and you get the actual energy momentum four vector which is uh, E over C and then P. Um, and uh, this, the Einstein summation convention for it, uh, for C squared uh, PI PI is, um, it turns out then to be um, C squared P squared minus E squared, and that's minus M squared C to the fourth. So this is the reason why in half or even more than half of the physics community, uh, people use eta with three minus signs. Then you get a plus sign here and people somehow like that. Um, I think it's a mistake. Um, 
uh, the time dilation factor is um, the energy of the particle divided by its rest energy. And um, velocity of a particle is the momentum divided by its uh, um, effective mass, which is E over C squared. And F equals MA turns into uh, dp d tor is the force fi. Okay, I think we can maybe skip the. This is an interesting, amusing example of what was actually done to compute the uh, energy needed to produce the first antiproton. So in SI units, um, or MKSA units in electrodynamics, the three-dimensional three, uh, three vector potential and the scalar potential form a covariant four-vector potential that's covariant, lower index. The contravariant one with an upper index is phi over C A. The magnetic induction is this. Another way to write it is, um, is that. And uh, the electric field is this. In three-dimensional notation, it looks like that. And um, uh, there's a very nice Faraday field strength tensor, which looks like this. And notice we're differentiating with respect to the contravariant coordinates, and we're differentiating the covariant um, uh, uh, components of the uh, four vector potential. And um, the electric field is then, uh, let's see, we had the electric field up here. The electric field is C Fi zero magnetic field is um, related. It's, well, it's the curl of A, but it turns out to be this more complicated structure here. And uh, we can use one of the Libby Chippy identities to go from B to F. In three, in three dimensional notation with SI units, uh, um, two of Maxwell, the two homogeneous Maxwell's equations are that there are no magnetic monopoles and Faraday's law. And then the two inhomogeneous in in ones are Gauss's law and uh, the Maxwell Ampere law, which is this. Here, rho sub f is the density of free charge, and this is the free current density. Free means the charges and currents are um, uh, not restricted by polar, don't arise from polarization, and they're not restrained by chemical bonds. Um, the divergence of H vanishes, and um, that means that uh, free charge is conserved. Because the, the divergence of the curl of H then is this and that, and that's the divergence of the free current density and uh, the time derivative of the free charge density. And uh, one can then see that uh, various constraints are preserved in time. Um, the homogeneous Maxwell uh, equations are a lot simpler. Uh, no magnetic monopoles in vacuum, they're even simpler. Well, uh, or let's maybe go to this case, homogeneous magnetic, uh, homogeneous uh, case. We still have these two equations, but then you have Gauss's law looking like this. And, um, the uh, Maxwell Ampere law takes this form. This is where we're going down to a sub nanometer scale where we don't have um, uh, D and E, uh, D and uh, H, we just deal with B and E. And uh, we have these uh, uh, equations. And if we set rho and J equal to zero, then things are even simpler. And these, of course, give you the wave equations in the vacuum. Um, uh, there's a principle of stationary action in um, uh, special relativity. Um, 
this gives you the Lorentz force law. We've been through this a number of times. I, I encourage you to read it, but I, don't, I think I'm going to skip it here. Um, there are some things about differential forms that are um, worth looking at because um, they're actually very simple. And if you take a covariant vector field and you contract it with a contravariant, contravariant coordinate differentials, you get something that's invariant actually under arbitrary coordinate transformations, not just Lorentz transformations. And, um, uh, and the reason is that, that uh, A prime I might be this and uh, dx prime i might be that. So this is a general transformation. And then these things sum out and just give you a delta function. So you're back to a. And this then is called a one form. <clears throat> and um, Ailey Cartan, um, who was the son of a blacksmith, by the way, um, invented uh, differential forms and other things. The wedge product of two is directed area spanned by the two differentials and it's defined to be intrinsically anti-symmetric. And so if you have coordinates U and V, uh, DU wedge DV is, this is DU and this is DV. And um, it's, uh, the area and if you change your coordinates there then the area changes by a Jacobian. Um, something quite simple is the exterior derivative D. D on F on a function is just basically a gradient times the DXI. So, and, and this is an invariant uh, structure. Um, the exterior derivative of, of this uh, one form is a two form and the two form in question. So you take DA, so you do DY of uh, AX and then you do DY wedge DX, DZ wedge DX, uh, DZ wedge DX. Notice you don't bother to do DX uh, of AX because that would give you a uh, dx wedge dx, which is zero. And so this dA turns into just the curl. The curl, um, the components of the curl are this, that, and that, but then you multiply them by these uh, wedge products. And if you take the exterior derivative of this, what you get is um, you just, you just differentiate AJ with respect to XI and you change DXJ by wedging it with DXI. And because this is anti-symmetric, this is a half FIJ. And then this thing is the uh, Faraday two form. The square of an exterior derivative vanishes. Um, and in fact, that's, um, the homogeneous Maxwell equations are basically DDA equals zero, and that's DF, and that's this thing. And this uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, these are the two homogeneous Maxwell equations. Um, let's see if I can make this flash them. Well, anyway, they're there. Um, a P form is said to be closed if DH is zero. It's said to be exact if H is the differential of some, uh, is the exterior derivative hitting some uh, P minus one form K. And uh, DD equals zero implies that every exact form is closed. That is to say, um, if H, H is exact, if it's DK, so you, so dh is ddk, but then ddk is zero, and so dh is zero. So if h is exact, it's certainly closed. And then what Poincaré showed is that um, every uh, closed form is locally exact. 
Um, and uh, so let's see what else. Sure, let me see what else we have here. Well, I think maybe instead of going through all the rest of this, um, I should maybe ask if there's somebody has a question or wants something explained. Um, let's see, we do have class tomorrow, but not on Thursday. That's my understanding. Um, so I guess you guys can answer, ask questions tomorrow. Um, Okay. Um, suppose B dot is uh, zero. Um, in other words, the time derivative of the magnetic field is zero. So this is a magnetostatic problem. B dot is zero, then Faraday's law tells us that curl of E is zero. And uh, so E is this one form, the vanishing of the curl of E is that uh, DE is then this thing here is zero. So DE is zero and we say E is closed. But it's also exact because we can define a quantity V whose gradient is E. And uh, the way we do that is we first define V sub P as an integral of EI dxi along some path from some chosen point to the point x. And you'd think this would depend, in general, this would depend upon the path, but because the curl of E is zero, um, it turns out, of course, that the difference between two paths is just a, so in other words, you have the integral of E this way or the integral of E that way. And the difference of the two is the um, uh, integral of the curl of E dotted into the area, the area enclosed, and um, that curl of E vanishes. And so that is gone. And so um, we can define E as minus the gradient of V, which is to say that E is exact as well as closed. Um, there's a general form, the, the, the generalization of this was done by Stokes, which was that the integral of any P form H over the boundary of any P plus one dimensional simply connected orientable region R is equal to the integral of the P plus one form DH over R. So this is, this is, um, uh, um, essentially that, whoops, hold on. So let me go to red. Um, so this is, for example, the integral of uh, E dot DL is equal to the integral of the curl of E uh, dot DS. So this is, this is, um, over the region R, and this is over the boundary of the region R. Mathematicians use um, uh, this thing is boundary, whoops, damn it. Boundary of R. And um, so the picture here is that the integral of E along that is the integral of the curl of E along the enclosed surface. And we often see that in the form that the um, integral say of A along a per perimeter is equal to the integral of the curl of A over the surface. Okay, we're just about out of time. I don't see any more questions. Um, uh, 
So what I propose then tomorrow, I'm going to talk about general relativity. And um, as I said, this has become much more important um, and much simpler. It used to be that one made general relativity into a very mysterious sort of subject. Um, it's now becoming uh, more and more a part of ordinary physics and uh, it's been demythologized uh, to some extent. And for practical purposes, what we know is that uh, space is basically flat um, and uh, the only thing that is different is that um, space is expanding. So it's flat space expanding and the expansion rates is accelerating. Um, and we've already seen some general relativity in the section on uh, cosmology and the example, cosmological examples in the chapter on differential equations. Um, okay, so what I ought to do, of course, is assign more homework do the following Sunday after um, the Thanksgiving break. Um, when I was a student, I always thought of Thanksgiving break as a chance to catch up. And um, apparently some of you regard Thanksgiving break as a holiday. And since we're not supposed to go anywhere because of the pandemic, I don't see it as much of a holiday. All right, well, I'll just uh, urge you all to stay out of bars and uh, general, generally avoid indoor crowds. That's the most important thing. And um, I'll, we can talk tomorrow at uh, 5.30. So I'll basically, um, I think I'll stop the sharing now and uh, end the meeting. Um, so goodbye, everybody.